Welcome, everyone. Welcome to everyone on the internet. We are live streaming this. It may be recorded for later. Pay attention now, because I can't promise I can tell you later how to get to said recording. I'm Jeff Smith. This is Maria Colgan. Maria said to me a while back, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we did some role play for the folks at K-Scope? And I was like, yeah, that'd be awesome. It wasn't quite those words. So I'm going to pretend. She's going to pretend. We're going to tell a little story. Once we start, we'll be in character, and it'll be no more of this Deadpool, third wall stuff, fourth wall stuff, all right? Uh, you know where to find us online. I'm that Jeff Smith. She's at SQL Maria. We're both on the database team. She uh, does more core database stuff, and I do more database tool stuff, but we're one big happy family, so we kind of mix and match. And with that, we'll get started. Most of everything we're showing you today, you can use right now. We just always include this slide just in case we mess up. You can sing along if you want, if you know the words. Yeah. It's cute for like five seconds and everyone's like, let's go. This is me. I'm your friendly developer? Yeah, I know. I know. I'll just come out of character one more time. I was in the Disney shop and I was expensing the outfit and someone told me no. So you'll just have to, you'll have to make do. Uh, my uh, story reputation is that I'm fast and agile. I like to deliver product quickly, apparently. And I don't like to beat around the bush. Let's just get stuff done, even if it's not the best way. So I'm going to play the role of the DBA today. Um, I'm much more conservative. Uh, I'm all about making sure that we do it right the first time. And I'm very much risk averse. I, my catchphrase is, let's not get hacked. So I want to make sure that when we do it, we do it right. And we do it so that we can uh, scale and it's secure. So we're going to walk through a scenario where I'm asking her help to build an application for a coffee shop business that we've acquired. Unfortunately, I'm not sure Maria knows the difference between a pod racing starter's pistol and a blaster, as most DBAs, you know, tend to be. So let's see how this goes. Am I advancing the slides too quickly? Yes. Yes, I'm advancing the slides too quickly. <laughs> So, uh, Maria, oh, how God, are you? What does he want now? Yes, Jeff, my friendly developer, what can I do you? You know that thing where we go off and build systems and then after the fact ask you to support them in production? Yep, yep, I'm well aware of it. So we thought this time we would do it the right way. And I need you to stand up a MongoDB for me because we need a JSON document store for this new coffee shop thing you heard us talking about. So, hold on a second. MongoDB is not part of our corporate standard. What makes you think you need a MongoDB? It's only good in the test environments. Are you not on Reddit? I mean, it's all over the place. That's what us cool guys are using. Just because it's cool or you need it for a reason? It's, got, it's JSON. We need, we need JSON. You need JSON. Yes. Well, you know you can have JSON in the Oracle database. Next slide. Okay. 
In fact, you can store JSON in any column in a table in the Oracle database. Uh, and I can even put an is JSON constraint next. So that I can make sure that what your developers are putting into the database is genuine JSON documents as opposed to just random text. And what's nice about having it just as a regular column, it'll actually work with all of the other features and capabilities of the Oracle database. So why don't we stay secure on our known systems and use JSON? I'm looking at your code and I have a problem. Of course you do. We like to query stuff, like words and data and cool stuff. What's this blob thing? Don't worry, so next slide. Uh, regardless of how the JSON is stored, we're gonna be able to query that. And the reason is when I put that is JSON constraint on there, it's going to tell the Oracle database that it's JSON and we can then use simple dot notation that any developer who's worth their salt and knows SQL will be able to remember how to do. So if you, next slide. Uh, if you do a simple query like this, what I need is the table alias. So I need, uh, in this case, it's, we're going against orders because this is a coffee shop after all. Hopefully we'll have some orders. Um, and then I'll do the column name, which was order details. And then if I'm looking for the city within the location object, I can simply do dot location dot city. But you know what, should I just show you? I've got it running. I don't believe machine. you, you're all <laughs> fancy slides. And... You have no faith, my dear. But all right. So I've got, uh, let's just create a simple, just to prove that I, this is a live demo. I'm gonna drop, table doesn't exist. So let's go ahead and create our orders. So now we've got our orders table and I can go ahead and insert into. Now, because I'm inserting into a blob, you notice there that I am having to do a little bit of conversion to get my insert to work, but let me go ahead and just put that row in. So we've got one row inserted, being a good DBA, I will go ahead and commit that. And then if I do a describe, your JSON document has gone into order details inside in my table. And I can show you that it's in there by doing a quick select. So there's my one row that I inserted. And just because you're fussy about it and you wanna make sure that you know how to query it, I'll use that dot notation that I talked about. So table alias column name dot the uh, entry in the JSON document dot the, in this case it was an object. So I wanna go to a particular element within that object called city. So let's see what the city was. It says it's Dallas. And if I scroll back up to show you what I actually inserted, there you have in the JSON document that the city was Dallas. Now, do you believe me that you can use Oracle as a document store? That is indeed wicked cool. While you were doing that, I was having an impromptu Slacker channel meeting down at the cantina with my fellow teammates. And they are suggesting that we still need that MongoDB thing. Well, we're going to all do this on Docker images on our machines, so that's cool with your Oracle monolithic 1980s thing, but we are on the Dockers now, too. Okay, so... Next slide. Yes. Next, next slide. slide. I'm getting better. Oracle is indeed available on that Docker thing. In fact, you've got a couple of options. You can go directly to the Docker store uh, and download it from there, or you can go to GitHub and get the build files yourself so you can do anything specialized that you want in your particular Oracle. And in fact, I have them up on a server for you that you can just download them from our internal Docker image site with Oracle and not your Mongo. We've came back together and decided that this might work. I'm very glad that you and the boys in the cantina have decided that you could maybe try this Oracle thing. Okay. Uh, good luck with that. Let me know. We're going to go off and do this now. <laughs> Bonus effects. Uh, uh, uh. Are you mansplaining too soon? You're supposed to come back to me, right? No, nope. you come to me. Oh, yes. Hey, um, it's like we rehearsed it. Maria, you know that cool JSON stuff you just gave us a couple of hours ago uh -huh. in the Oracle database and that Docker image that we all love right now? We need to join that JSON-y stuff with our sales data. 
No, you don't. Not at this moment, you don't. I don't? No. Right? This moment, I think what you're trying to say to me is that you want to go back to Mongo because you want it to be rest enabled. Oh, I didn't write that one down. Yeah. <laughs> hey, um, we're all good, except now we need a rest API. So we need to go back to Mongo because Mongo does rest. So Oracle also uh, is fully rest enabled right out of the box, dude. No, it's not. Really? That sounds cool. Do you think that I don't understand what REST is? I don't think you know what REST is. Uh huh. See, what you're used to is this system where you got these two chatty things talking and they're communicating and establishing protocols and you've got sessions that persist and we're doing a web app and we can't have your fancy SQL Daddy OCI stuff hanging around for hours on end with transactions. We need to have a quick bang bang transaction. And that's why you want to use REST? No, the way I said it sounds better. OK. Uh, well, thank you for mansplaining what REST is to me, Jeff. I do appreciate that. But I am fully aware of what it is. And Oracle is REST enabled out of the box. Uh, we've got this thing called the Oracle REST Data Service, or ORDS. Um, and when you issue your REST call, we're going to translate that into SQL executed against the database, and then the results of that query can be sent back over to the application via REST call, even as a JSON document, if that's what's needed. So whatever you need, you can do with the Oracle that I gave you in the Docker image. In fact, you can do it directly on your laptop because you can create this ORDS on your SQL developer. So even if you guys are working offline, with your Docker, uh, you can have everything running on your laptop through SQL Developer. You want me to show you how to do that? Because I know you don't know anything about SQL Developer, Jeff. I feel a little, I feel a little bad about the mansplaining, so I'm going to let you Mansplain own this right moment. Back at you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so to set up uh, ORDS in my SQL Developer, the first thing I'm going to do is go to the Tools menu. I'm going to scroll down there to REST Data Services, and I'm going to hit Install for the first time. And then once I get there, it's going to open uh, this dialog. And what it's going to do is I need to, first of all, specify the location for my REST config files. You guys can just leave it at the default, because uh, I know you're not good at finding stuff. Go ahead and click Next. Um, you want to run this in standalone mode. That way, when you're taking the train home at night, you can still uh, use it. And go with the specified port of 8080. Then you simply click Next and uh, finish. And then what you're going to do is refresh your connection on the left hand side so that you actually get to see the REST service, data service on the menu. Once you get there, you're going to right click on that module and click new module. Now, this is where it's going to get interesting. You've got to give that module a name. So in our case, since we're creating a coffee shop uh, application, let's call it coffee shop. And then we're going to supply the universal resource identifier. And again, I'm going to just supply coffee shop. And then click to make the REST public, uh, the REST service public, and allow for page, uh, page in uh, to the default. So you good? You keep going. You should have more of these. So we're nearly there. Uh, so we need to supply the rest of the URI or the universal uh, resource identifier pattern. In our case, since we're going to be trying to put data in and out of the orders table, let's call it orders, we're going to set the priority to high. And then we're going to allow for HTTP uh, entity tags. And then we're going to hit next. My clicker is not nearly advancing as fast as I would imagine it should. Then I'm going to confirm <laughs> the configuration and click finished. And then uh, at that stage, we now have our uh, REST uh, fully enabled. But what we want to do now is create a REST endpoint so that you guys have something to call in your code. So what we're going to do now is right click on our orders. And then we need to figure out what type of REST call we're going to want. Now, Given the fact you're probably going to want to insert the orders. I want to me... add a doc. You want to add a doc. All right. So let's do a uh, post uh, so that we can insert uh, your doc into the orders table. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, select the type of rest call as post. And then I'm simply going to 
uh, click apply to create that initial placeholder. Now at this point, we've got the placeholder, but it's not doing anything. I need to write the SQL that that call is going to back, uh, that's going to back that call on the database side. So if I right click on post, it's going to open a dialog for us and we'll do a simple uh, PL SQL block there that says I'm going to insert the entire payload. So the colon body means it's the entire payload of that JSON document into the orders column of the orders table. You with me so far? So it looks like we can run any of your fancy database code we want right here. Absolutely. So if you click next, what you'll get is, uh, oh, finally save our changes. And then what you'll get is the, uh, the rest, the endpoint for your rest. And since I am such a proficient DBA, I have some code that I can show you running Please on do. my machine. Uh, let me try that. So. Can I just say that stuff that you were just showing looks brilliant. Whoever built that must be a genius. I know. Awesome stuff, That's right? It's my Pro. favorite thing ever. I know. Chris Rice, he's amazing. Yeah. Uh, I heard about him. Uh huh. All right, so here's a little bit of Java, uh, a small Java app one of your developers gave me. And if I show you where I'm, what the config is I'm running before I kick it off. So if we look at the arguments, you can see there that I'm starting 10 threads and then I'm using that same uh, REST endpoint that we just created using SQL Developer. So let's go ahead and run that. And what we should start to see, uh-oh, <laughs> my REST services. Oh, no, there we go. So there goes all of the orders into the table. Uh, we'll let that run for a few minutes so we can see some orders going into my table. And I'll stop it and jump back over to SQL Developer. And if we let's see. Just a developer trick since you've been so nice. Sometimes it takes the software a few seconds to warm up. So. Oh, do you think that's what it was? Yeah. So I just didn't plug it and plug it back in if it doesn't. Now work. my orders table has 99 records in it, so uh, making it much more efficient to just do it through the REST. So you're good to use Oracle since now you've got a REST endpoint? For now, I think so. All right. Well, let me know if you need any more help with the uh, application because you know your deadline is, is this week. I think maybe you're going to knock a bunch of hours off our delivery time with this. So. I think that's the nicest thing you've ever said to me, Jeff. Today. I mean, we're not done yet. Let's, we can kiss each other's butts when we get across the finish line. So far, so good. That wasn't in the script, I don't think. <laughs> so I haven't heard much from that guy, Jeff, about the coffee shop app. And I know it was supposed to go live last week. I better figure out what they're doing. Hey, Jeff, what are you guys doing with the coffee shop application? I saw it went live. What yeah. are you guys doing now? Is it all good? It's really weird. I just went through this wormhole and it opened a temporal timeline issue. And it's like I lived this moment like 20 minutes ago. Really weird. Um, so real deja vu right now. Um, so it's good. People are happy. But now we need a way to like help the business people. So they want to join our sales data with the customer data. Oh, like are they doing some kind of promotions and marketing for like top 10 customers? Yeah, yeah. They track when you walk in the room and see that you've had your 10th latte today and they're going to give you a coupon tomorrow or something like that. So I think what we have to do is get all the JSON down and then find a way with some custom Java classes to like, you know, build it more into a relational way with our existing customer data. So that's what we're kind of stuck right now, but we're, we'll get there. It's code. It's just code. So what you're telling me is you're going to take all the data from the relational database, mm -hmm. including your JSON workload or documents, and you're going to do the join in the app? Yeah, we just like to put all the data in a flat file. It's nice and safe there. And then we write a bunch of code, and then cool stuff pops out. And we leave you alone, and everyone's happy. OK, no, we're definitely not going to do that. That is not going to be the secure way, and we are not going to be on the news. So um, why don't I just help you write a SQL statement? Isn't the customer data in the same database where we put your JSON, the uh, JSON order? Yes. So why don't we just write a simple SQL statement to do the join inside in the database? You made us put it there. You know it's there. Okay. It's only there because you made us. It's true. So. Before I can do that, you, I better figure out what you've actually put into these JSON documents, because I know you were using JSON so you didn't have to build a data model, so I have no idea what they look like. So I can do that locally by using the Oracle JSON data guide. I can just run a simple query, and it'll show me what's inside of your JSON. Next slide. 
So if I look inside your JSON, so if I just simply select the JSON data guide uh, from your table, and what I'll see is all of the different elements that are in your JSON documents, and I can even see what types they are. Now, you said you've got to join the customer table, right, to the orders? Yes. So it looks like I'm going to need that loyalty card number. Is that the key between these two? Yes. All right. So let's write a very simple SQL statement to get us the top 10 customers that we need uh, by city so that we can send out those coupons that you mentioned. So all I need is the name, customer name. I need the city location from the JSON doc, which I can select out using my lovely dot notation. I can run an aggregation or a sum across the sales amount for each of those customers. And then I can join the customer table to one of the elements inside in your JSON document, which is your loyalty card number. Click. Um, and that's going to allow me to do the join without having to take any of the JSON documents out to the app to uh, unpick them. Um, and we can even do a group by uh, over those columns. And then what you'll notice is I've given you the fetch first 10 rows syntax there um, so that you guys don't have to wrap the query in a select count star and put a row num on it. That way you're only going to get 10 rows back. So a couple thoughts. Whiz bang, awesome, thank you. Thought number two, excellent formatting. Thank you. You must have a great tool again. Um, thought three, uh, we can't write this junk. I mean, that, that's like... DBA weirdo talk. Are you looking for a Sesame Street version of the SQL, Jeff? Is that what you're trying to ask me for? My queries like, are like select star, and then sometimes I put in a where just if I get, you know. If you're feeling fancy? If I feel like I've had a coffee or something, then I'll add a where clause. Okay. So why don't I create a view to make it easy for you guys to write your Sesame Street SQL? So I'm going to create a view, and I'm going to call it top 10 customers making it super easy for you guys uh, to be able to do a select star. I'm going to use that exact same query, and I'm going to go ahead and create the view. So if you, when you run, if you go to your next, if you can run simply select star from top 10 customers. Oh, yeah, that's what our code looks like now. All right. So let me go ahead and just show you how I can do that on our data set. So we tried to make this relatable to you guys. <laughs> So this is what the query looked like. Let me go ahead and just run that. And remember, I've got those 99 rows there in my orders table after we did a few inserts. So pretty fast, but I know that's way more SQL than you can handle. So let me jump over and create that view for you. Because Lord knows you couldn't just learn If we some copy SQL. and paste the code wrong, it's wrong all over the place. So. So select star, you say? Yeah. All right, so let's do select star from top 10 customers now that we have our view in place. And you'll get the same answer that I had before. So we're all good. Are we? I have a couple more thoughts. You do. Am I early on the thoughts? No, you can have a thought, I guess. There's no limit on just one a day, I guess. <laughs> if you can get Maria to come work with you, you're in a very good spot. Yeah. So um, that looks fine, but I still think it might be faster and even safer, less volatile to just grab all it down and do it our way. Are you worried about the data volume growing? You think it'd be faster? We're a pretty successful it? coffee shop. We have a database just for the drinks here. Wow, it's like as if we're they were growing. Disney. I yeah. Know. Okay. Well, if you're worried about it, if you're worried that the join will take too long as the data volume grows, we can create something called a materialized view. And what that'll allow us to do is pre aggregate the data on whatever, in our case, by customer and by city, um, and have it materialized in the database already. And then when the queries come in, they'll be automatically rewritten to go to that materialized view. So even though you're doing select star from top 10 customers, under the covers, Oracle's going to translate that and rewrite it to this materialized view. I've never heard of such wonder and, and magic. Yes, this is the magic of the Oracle database, Jeff. We have real queries, though. I mean. Oh, yeah. So go ahead and let's take a look at what a materialized view query would look like. So this is, I'll just create a materialized view called top 10 customers. Uh, it's going to be not quite the query you're after, 
because I'm going to do the aggregation, but I'm not going to do the order by or the fetch first 10. I'm just going to keep it simple so that we can reuse this materialized view for a number of different customers you might want. Because if we, if the marketing de department changed their mind and they're looking for maybe 20 customers or 100, the same materialized view will work for those queries as well. So um, let me go ahead and just create that for you on my little system and you'll be able to see how it works. So let's go over here and we'll create our materialized view. And then if we were to run the query, what, let me go ahead and just do an explain plan for you. I know it's a foreign concept for you, but- She writes SQL really fast. I do. Um, if we look at the explain plan, what you'll notice there is we've got a materialized view rewrite access going on and it's rewriting your query to use the top 10 customers uh, MV. And if I run that, because I've pre-aggregated it, it's even faster than it was before. So you see there that uh, it's even faster than when I ran it against just the regular view. Um, cool. Lots of data. Sub-second, we need it whiz bang fast. Okay. So you're worried that just because I did this only on 99 rows that it won't be fast if let's say we had 2.5? This needs to be good once we leave your little Docker doohickey toy. We've got lots and lots of data and customers and millions of dollars and yeah. So you're worried about size? Uh, Surely that should be my thought, not yours, but okay. Um, let's assume we are worried about size. Um, then uh, I believe I have some history data available uh, on the system. I've got an orders history table that I was testing with, and it's got about 2.5 uh, million rows in it. So let me just put you back over there. So if we go next. So select star, we get the materialized view that I showed you, keep going. And so let's do it on the larger data set. It's got 2.5 million JSON documents in it. Exactly the same query. The only thing that's changing is that instead of orders, now we're going to do it against order history. Oops, you've gone too far. So let's go ahead and do that. Now, it's going to take a little longer when I create the materialized view against the orders because uh, there's, it's a larger thing. It'll take about a minute now for this to, to run. But you think you've got this now, that if we put the materialized views in place for the reports that you need to run, that we should get the performance you need? For those reports, but you know we have those army of Ewoks that just sit around and ask all the questions the CEO is wondering, like how many Slurpees did we sell yesterday? And we don't have a query for that. So I need it to be fast for like, you know, all that weird ad hockey stuff too. All right, well, let's first make sure that the materialized views for the known reports are working. So let's just check that we are rewriting even, uh, when I'm using order history, we're rewriting against that materialized view. And if I execute the query there, I'm able to get you the response times in uh, less than a second for all of those canned reports that you've got. Yeah. Hundredth of a second should be good. Hundredth of a second, you're good with that? Yeah. And apparently I'm a big coffee drinker, just saying. Well, as fast as you write code, yeah. Yeah, I know, that's what makes me able to write all that super fast So code. we're good on this one, but what about all those little weird Ewok reports? Are you talking about the data scientists, the guys that can write any We, we query? call them Ewoks because they're weird. They're pointy hat types. I mean, they went to business school and they think they know coding, but you know, it's select star froms mostly. Okay, um, yeah, all right. Well, if, and you're saying we don't know what kind of SQL they'll actually have, is that what you're thinking? It'll be, you know, really cool charts and graphs they print out, but I don't know what the SQL is before they write it. it it's gotta be like, you know, not sub-second, but if it's not 30, if it's more than 30 seconds, they'll just sit there and hit refresh and hit the page over and over again, and then my pager rings, and then I ring your pager, so. So we're thinking we wanna kinda keep them in the five to 10 second range? Yeah, that'd make them happy. All right, well, one of the things we can do is we can put our uh, data set into the in-memory column store. If I can click the button right there you go. And if we place it in the in-memory column store, the data will be stored in a columnar format, 
and that's going to allow us to speed up any kind of analytical query that the data scientists might run by only accessing the columns that they need for the query, and it'll also give us the ability to compress that data so we can get more of it in memory, and we'll be able to scan and filter the data in its compressed format. So it should really give us the performance boost that we need for them to be able to write any query at all against our uh, workload and, and get that kind of performance. And you can just put it in there and it'll stay? Yeah, so unlike the buffer cache and some of the other in-memory pools that we have in the Oracle database today, the in-memory column store is truly a store. Once the objects go in, they'll be automatically maintained and they'll remain in memory uh, until we actually ask to remove them or we shut down the database instance. So they should always be there and we should automatically just use it if the data scientists are run, writing those kind of reports or, or analytic stuff. Okay. So why don't, now my only concern with the, um, have you told any of the data scientists what are in your JSON documents? Uh, no, we don't really know ourselves sometimes. Yeah, and I'm not sure they it's can flexible. use the, yeah, it's such a, uh-huh, okay. We're, sch we're schemaless. Yeah. That's on the Reddit too, mm -hmm. pretty cool. All right, so why don't I do this? Why don't I create some uh, material, or sorry, some virtual columns for them so that when they describe the table, they can actually know what, uh, what they're, what's in there so they know how to write their queries. If they just see a blob in there, that's Jason, they're not gonna know how to uh, run their analytics. So let's go ahead and create some virtual columns for them first, and then we can place it in memory. In fact, let me show you how this is gonna look. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, create just the, the four virtual columns that I think they're gonna need most, one for city, one for state, one for the sales amount and the loyalty card number. So let's go ahead and get those virtual columns created. And because they're not materialized, they really are just virtual columns. Uh, they're only materialized once they're selected. That doesn't cost me anything to have those. And if I now describe the order's history table though that they would be going against, now you see there's your JSON documents but I also now have the information on some of the entries in those JSON documents so that those developers or the data scientists will be able to write their queries more effectively because they'll know what kind of data is in there. I saw this another thing on the Reddit. It's, it's called info. It's like supposedly better than describe. That might be cool later. I can show you. Uh, uh huh. Yeah. Okay. You can teach your grandma to suck eggs, I guess. Yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> no, but, so, so it looks like they're there. They're kind of there. You just yeah. made it easy for me to get, and I don't have to know how to do the whole JSON stuff. Exactly. So if you, here's a version of the query that we've been playing around with that's written against the virtual columns instead of having to know all of the syntax to um, do the dot notation to get in and around in the JSON document. So I can write the exact same query now just using the virtual columns instead of using uh, the JSON dot notation and having to know what's inside your JSON documents. Because Lord knows you're gonna make changes and not tell anybody because you're just that type. Well, the business, we move at the speed of light, you know, and that's why we need all this fancy stuff. Oh, Data yeah. models are, I mean, we'll probably figure out we needed a data model later, but this will do for now. We'll retrofit it, right? Okay, yeah. so now that we've got our virtual columns, why don't we place these tables in memory so that uh, we can make sure that the system's ready to go for the data scientists. So the first thing I need to do for that is to go ahead and uh, mark both of the tables for in memory. So let me go ahead and do that pretty fast. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna access both of those tables because I've set it up in such a way that the objects will only be populated into the in-memory column store when they're being accessed, uh, or sorry, after they've been accessed for the first time. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, do the, so it looks like we've already got the count back for customer. We've got 1,018 customers in there and we've got, like I said, 2.5 million uh, JSON documents in there. So we just want to check that they're actually all being populated. So let's look at V$IM segments. 
So customers is already complete. It's fully populated. The column bytes not populated is zero, indicating that the customer table is now fully in memory in the columnar format. The order history table says it started to be populated, but it's still not finished. So if I rerun that query, we'll see that counter uh, there on the um, right-hand side uh, counting down. So still not finished, but a lot less bytes to go. And if I just keep querying that, we'll be able to watch it go down as more and more of the uh, order history table gets populated into the in-memory column store. Once it's populated, we'll be able to uh, take a look at a query and see uh, it take advantage of the in-memory column store. And that way, as you said, they don't need to know anything about uh, what's going on in your JSON documents. Okay, so now the order history is uh, completely populated in there. And what I didn't tell you, Jeff, but those virtual columns that we created, although they weren't materialized on disk, they have been materialized into the in-memory column store. They go into in-memory as in-memory expressions. And that way, when they um, run the queries against those virtual columns, when the data is in the in-memory column store, I'm able to get all of the advantages of uh, having real column data in there. So I'll be able to scan and filter that data in its compressed columnar format. So let's go ahead and just run the query that's accessing those virtual columns in the in-memory column store. Okay, so it took three seconds, which is not as fast as when we had the uh, materialized view because we pre-aggregated everything when we had the materialized view. We were simply just selecting it back out. But to do the aggregation and to scan all of that data um, and uh, everything, that should be plenty. Because you said as long as it's less than five or ten seconds, we should be good, right? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Great. Well, we'll just try it again and now that, let's see if we can get it to go a little Sometimes faster. Sometimes if it comes Three back seconds. too fast, they think the system's broke. And they'll just run it again? Yeah. <laughs> so, then I think you should be good. We're going to use materialized views for all of the canned reports to make sure they're fast so the BI dashboards refresh quickly. And so you just need to send me those and I'll create the materialized views for you. And then I'm just going to place the tables into the in-memory column store as well, just so that we're covered from uh, the data scientists and we get no complaints from anybody. So I think we should be good to go live with this. I have to say it sounds pretty awesome. And I feel bad for the previous mean things I said about you and your family. Oh. oh that was not to your face. Sorry. I, I still feel bad, though. I mean... I'm not a people person, yeah, I'm a developer, sorry. We need to make this a panto, yeah, boo. Um, but yes, uh, no, that's all right, Jeff. I understand uh, what you guys say among yourselves and how hard it is to be a woman in IT, but- We fear you know, what we don't understand. Yeah. I clearly don't understand DBAs or women, so it's my fault, not yours. Oh, well, as long as you know your place and you know it's your fault. We have an open good. moment, it's all good. So, um, I like how the commands to put this stuff in memory is so easy, too. It is super easy, right? All you got to remember is in memory. It makes you look really smart, but really you're just running like select star froms almost. <laughs> it's as if it's that simple. Hey, um, I think we're ready to go to prod, but uh, hold on, I'm getting a call here from Chewy. Yeah? She said scurf, scruffy. Uh huh. Nerf what? All right, hold on. Um, that was Chewy, the security guy? It was. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like juggling four things up here. Yeah. Uh, apparently, it's bad if certain Ewoks, the, I'm sorry, the really smart data people see our customer, he called it sensitive data. I don't know if it cries if you look at it, but it's like, and we need to hide it or something. So can you help with that too? Yeah, you want to redact some of the sensitive data. Did he say which column might be the, uh, the issue? Uh, is it uh, an ID? It could be the customer ID. So what you're saying is if the data scientist was to run one of your Sesame Street sequels, right? Yeah, I don't want to have to write code. I figured out I can just come to you and you can like do it faster and easier and better. So let's do that again, but with this. Okay, so you're saying that if they do a select star from the customer table, we don't want them to be able to see 
that customer ID. I don't the want them to card. see that. I just want it to be like gibberish or nothing or just not the real data. Zero good enough? Zero works. All right. So we can do that. What I can do is I can create a redaction policy that works on our coffee shop schema. It's going to work on the customer table and on the customer ID within there. And what I'm going to basically give it a name of redact the loyalty card number. And uh, what it's going to do is it's going to redact it in full. So we could do things where we just replace the last four digits if it was a social security or uh, well, I can help with number. regular expressions. I'm good at that stuff. Uh -huh. I no. go to Stack Overflow and just copy and paste. It's mm. awesome. OK, thanks for the tip. Yep. Um, but no, um, let's just redact all of the loyalty card number. Yeah, 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 and that's good. I'm not going to put a where clause predicate on it, but I could have only put it on some of the entries in the table if I wish. So I'm just going to say where 1 equals 1, so it's true for all of the rows in the table. So let me go ahead and just uh, run that. So now that we've got our redaction policy in place, if I go back over here and let's pin the original result of the query that we got, right, where we could see all of the customer IDs. Now with the redaction policy in place, if I run that query again, you'll see none of the customer IDs are showing up for the same user. So we've redacted all of the customer or loyalty card numbers out. So we should be good. Chewy should give a sign off to be able to push this application into production for the data scientists. Can you like give us a rest endpoint on that too? Sure, I can totally rest enable that for you. Sweet. I'm out of here. Oh. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. So, do you get to see the data? Um, well, right now, yeah, because I'm the DBA, uh, but we could put Data Vault in place that would prevent yeah. me from seeing it too. I'll talk to Chewy offline and see nice. whether or not we, I need to be That's security at. stuff. We don't worry about that. No, as a developer, I guess you don't. Well, we get in trouble afterwards, so I guess we kind of have but to worry about it. That's why you got, to, you got to work more closely with the DBA team. So you gave us the JSON stuff we wanted. Yep. So we get our flexible schema. Yep. It's fast. And I get to use all these fancy SQL analytic -y type things. Mm -hmm. I can't really, and, and it's all in our dockers, and it's all coming out the way we want. The arrest. Yep. And you wrote a bunch of code for us. I did. And if I ever have problems, you'll fix it for me. I mostly. will. So I think we're good. It's amazing. What so, can I do for you? <laughs> well, we'll talk about that <laughs> after. Yeah, yeah, this is a family show. Um, but so are you trying to say to me that you no longer see Oracle as the old legacy database? It's a really, really cool, mature database. Gotta do your bit. So it's not legacy. You're it's not legacy at all. No, it's cutting edge. It's got everything we need. You're going the wrong way. Are these my slides? Yes. I didn't know these were my words. So what you're telling me is they're going to be the universal peacemaker between you and I, and that we're going to stop fighting and we're going to start working together like DevOps should. I'm because not sure we'll stop fighting, but we're going to be much better friends now. Yes, the flexibility, yes. So our data, we don't know what it's going to look like. We need to have stuff added coming in and out. And not all the records will be uniform, so the JSON stuff support is awesome. Our app's not going to be just the web app that I told you about. Someone's already working on a mobile app. They're using Swift or some other cool thing they saw on Reddit. So the REST APIs will be really, really, really helpful. Cool. Um, you showed us it works for the small environments. You can, like, have millions of probably not billions of records in there. And yep. you gave us the sub second or three second response times for the Ewok pointy hat, smart or SQL data scientists. scientists the data sci I'm, I see I'm learning too, data scientists. And we get to use all the fancy SQL that the database engine gives us. Right. So, in fact, yeah. we could even run a SQL class for your developers if you wanted. That might be good. Yeah. Oh. And then you wrote a little bit more code and you did the security stuff for us so we don't expose the sensitive data to the business people that don't need to see that part. That's right. So now I think we're happy. Cool. Well, I'm glad that the Oracle database has managed to make you happy and has kept us both secure and uh, stable. So we should be able to go into productions without any problems and I may actually be able to get some sleep. I'm so glad we rehearsed this. I know. It would have been so much better if we had. <laughs> 
There's no sound on that. Oh. No, and we just thank you very much for joining us, folks. We hope you found it enjoyable and you learned something a little bit about how the Oracle database can be the universal peacemaker in your business to get your developers and your DBAs not only to talk to each other, but actually work together and be more successful. So teaser, all of those cool features she used when database 18.3 comes out later this summer for XE will have all of that cool stuff. Correct, in the XE. So you'll be able to do everything we did here today on the free version of the Oracle database, Oracle database 18C XE that comes out later this year. Um, you can put it into, we'll in fact have it in Docker containers available for you or in virtual boxes if that's what you want. Uh, and you can run it for your dev environments and be able to have your DBAs and your, de with, uh, sorry, your developers work without having the DBAs to stand up systems for them, but have all the full functionality of everything we just showed you. So it should be pretty powerful dev and test environment. And the ORDS REST stuff is included with your database license and is supported by Oracle support. So There you go. We have time for questions. Hey, thanks to the people online who hung out. Or did it, Chris? Did they stay on for the? Are they still there? Did we lose them? Some of them are still there. Thank you. Uh, I, my role was normally played by Gerald Vinzel, a product manager at headquarters. I did my best to fill in. I think my jokes were better. His timing probably better than mine. So uh, between us, we have product managers, formerly or currently, of in memory, optimizer, optimizer, SQL developer, yeah. REST data services. Or, yeah. Boards, kind of XE. So if you guys have questions on any of those things, we'll we're happy, happy to hang out and take yep. those. Yeah. I have two questions. One on the redaction. Yes. Uh, is it uh, available with the regular Oracle, or do you need to buy it or have a special license? To use? Redaction requires enterprise plus advanced security. Definitely, it requires enterprise. I'm not sure I've, if the I think redaction. Does need this Always check pack. your licensing it does, guide. It does. It's one of the security packs. Yeah. Uh, it was introduced in 12. It did get backported to 11.204. So if you're on Terminal 11 GR2, it's available with the licensing, and it's there in 12C. And for 18C, if you can fit it all in the suggested or the required size limits, it's it's included and free there too. Yeah. Yes, so the question is, can I index my JSON uh, documents? And you can, you can build a text-based index on that so that you could actually do full, uh, excuse me, full text searching on that, on all of the elements within the JSON document. Uh, so yes, uh, it's fairly straightforward. In fact, I uh, did a, an example of it in the Sunday symposium that we had, the database symposium, and I uploaded all of those slides just this morning to my blog. So if you go to sqlmaria.com, uh, the current post has access to all of those slides, including an example of creating a text index on the JSON data. So on my second question, RA, <laughs> Um, yeah, if you create a virtual column on it, then you can, because you can index a virtual column. Yeah. Yeah. Now, as I understand it, since it's just text and not its own specific data type, it basically gets all of the features in the database for free. Yeah, basically. Jeff's right. Like basically, because we store it in either a varchar, a blob, or a club, um, it gets all of the access to everything. Um, so one of the ways you can do it is that kind of like under the cover, it's a, it's a function based index is what's really going to happen. You can create the virtual column and then create the index on that and under the covers we'll make it a function based index for you that will be against the JSON on a particular element. Yeah. Question 2B. Oh wow. There was no mention up front that this 2B was a multi-part question, on, but okay, it. yeah, all right. Yes, so our, uh, you're asking, can I partition uh, the table that's got the JSON in it? And not only can I partition it, can I partition it on the JSON column? Um, you can partition on a virtual column. So uh, you, if you did it that way, then yes, you could uh, partition on the JSON, but it would be on the virtual column you created 
in, on the element for within the JSON documents that you want. Yeah. yeah. You're welcome. Hey, I also just wanted to say, um, I was playing a character up here. I don't have such disdain for developers in general. Just, and he is nicer to women most of the time. Just yeah, a yeah. little bit. Yeah, I don't believe the copy and paste Stack Overflow and Reddit stuff. That's all just a horrible, yeah. Any other questions? So the question is, which is faster if I've got my data hybrid columnar compressed on my on Exadata storage, or I have um, the data in memory compressed using the in-memory compression? And it really will depend on the query, because if you remember and how your data is stored in memory on the, the rack cluster, like if you can imagine it's an Exadata server, when I run a query on Exadata, there are, let's say I've got a full rack. I was a very good kid and Santa brought me an entire full rack for Christmas. That gives me 14 storage cells. So every query that executes runs with a DOP effectively of 14 because 14 storage cells all run to help answer my question. And then typically there's a storage index down there as well that's gonna help do some pruning. Um, in the in-memory column store, assuming I have populated it across all eight rack nodes, uh, I can run a parallel degree with it e either on a single node or across all eight nodes, which would help. Um, and when it's in memory, it is compressed. It's a slightly different compression to HCC compression, but it is compressed. And I can do all the same tricks with storage indexes in the in-memory column store that I can do with the exadata. So because it's in-memory versus storage, the in-memory column store should be a little bit faster, assuming the DOP is identical. But if you run a serial query that's automatically parallelized because of the 14 storage cells, and then you run a serial query in memory, Exadata can be as fast, even though it's coming from disk versus memory. So it does, you need to make sure that the comparison is apples to apples if you're gonna do it. Where in memory starts to come into its own over the Exadata storage cells is when there's a large number of concurrent queries. So the Exadata storage is fantastic if I'm the only one who's using all of the bandwidth. If there's enough concurrent queries going on, um, then that bandwidth can get bottlenecked. And the bandwidth from DRAM to CPU is far larger than anything from disk uh, up to the server can be. So coming from main memory and going to the CPU allows me to sustain a lot more concurrent queries. So the way most customers are using in memory on their Exadata storage is actually to separate the users. So for example, when we were talking today, we talked about having data scientists, folks that are running truly ad hoc queries that we've no idea where they're going with it. What you can do is allow those ones to use the data that's in memory on the rack nodes in your Exadata environment and segregate them out of the way so that your regular workload can continue to use the Exadata storage uh, and get all the benefits and get all the bandwidth from that while those data scientists are getting very fast response times, but they're only using uh, memory. They're not using any IO bandwidth to do those queries or vice versa. You know, you can put your workload in memory and have the data scientists use the, use the disk, whichever you want. Um, but yeah, a lot of customers are very happy with running in memory on their Exadata. Um, I'm not supposed to say this. Uh, oh, I forgot we're streaming online. Um, yeah, I won't say it. I'm just not gonna say it. Oh, great, okay, if the audio could out, then you can uh, extend the life of your Exadata by adding in memory. Okay, there you go. <laughs> so Kane, just really quickly, it is Kane? That's what your name tag says. I don't know if you stole it from some kid or something, but um, you just asked a question that like one of four people on this planet could answer like that. And she's the only one that's allowed to come to these conferences. So for everyone Not else. Not anymore, apparently, if I get caught saying yeah. things like you can. <laughs> this is the value of coming to these conferences. Sorry. That was yeah. my follow-up question, and it's an honest question. Where do we get those kind of answers and that kind of guidance and direction other than the here? SQLMaria.com. To make on a yearly basis. But we need that kind of data to make the right decision. Um, yeah, I'd like to say everybody at Oracle could answer the question the same way, but as Jeff said, maybe not everybody would have the same wealth of experience that I've had. Um, but you can certainly contact me through sequelmaria.com. 
um, or uh, you can even reach out to us on the Ask Tom website. So if it's just a, you know, I'm thinking about this, is this versus that, what should I do? Um, you can certainly reach out to us. You can also reach out to your account team and say, I want to talk to somebody from development, uh, yeah. one of the experts, and we're more than happy. I know Bryn is also in the audience, one of the other PMs, and has done an awful lot of work with customers over the year to help improve their PL SQL um, coding skills yeah. and also just performance. So. And we have the real world performance and team. And edition based redefinition. <laughs> EBR. Uh, EBR. EBR, yeah. So, you know, the PMs are really here to help. And even if you don't know the right one because you're not sure who to ask, um, you can start with Ask Tom or you can start with your account team and they'll be able to navigate it to the right place. You even do office hours every now and then. <gasps> oh my gosh, yes, we do. Sorry, I should have made a plug for our office hours. So, if you go to Ask Tom, there is this new thing called office hours. And once a month, an awful lot of the PMs from the database team have an office hour where literally we get on a live webcast and you can ask us absolutely anything you want. Um, so uh, it's really just like it was back in college. You know, the, the professor's in, the door is open. Anybody can join and just listen in if you didn't actually have a question um, or you can ask questions. And if you just go to the Ask Tom website, there's a whole list of all different topics. Or uh, if you don't know which PM it should be addressed to, you can join Gerald Wenzel, uh, my usual uh, co-host for this session. And I, we just do anything. You can ask me anything about the Oracle database. Or you can just find one of us and email us, and we're happy to toss that to someone else or introduce <laughs> you to the, to the right product manager. Yeah. Anybody else? Hopefully an easier question that maybe I could answer, <laughs> like how select star from is bad. Yeah, you yeah. Know? Oh, you there's have a, a question. A question online. from the audience, yes. Um, so yeah, I don't know exactly what the restrictions are going to, so, pardon? It is going to be too, okay. So the question, uh, I, I, can they hear you or no? Okay, so the question that we were asked online was about uh, XE, um, Oracle A Database 18C uh, Express Edition. And what that is, is uh, the, the free developer in a, uh, version of the Oracle database. And it is limited to a two gig SGA, a two gig uh, memory allocation. Um, and so the question then was, given that I'm limited to two gigs, how much of an in-memory column store can I have? And how much data can I get into that in-memory column store? So the in-memory column store does come out of the SGA. A two gig SGA, you'd probably need a little bit of that for the buffer cache and the uh, Java pool and that. So let's imagine we gave half of it, 50% of it to the in-memory column store. So that's one gig. How much data can I get into the in-memory column store if I only had one gig? And um, you can be surprised, the because all of the data that's read into the in-memory column store is compressed, we see anywhere from two to 10x compression. So if I have one gig, um, I would imagine I could at least get two gigs worth of data into it, but I could even get up to 10 gigs worth of data into it. But there's another added feature, but wait, there's more. Don't buy now till I tell you the next bit. Next slide. Um, the, you don't need to put the entire table into memory. So if you've got a 10 gig table on disk and you're trying to squish it into one gig on memory, uh, of memory and it's not fully fitting, then what you can do is you can actually just select a subset of the columns, whatever you need for your analytic queries, and just put those columns into memory. So we allow you to slice and dice the data a little bit to make sure you get the most bang for your buck out of whatever in-memory area that you can give us. So there are lots of different ways they can do it. Um, and it doesn't even have to be the entire object. If you happen to partition the table, then just the partitions you need could go into memory. A long answer for what was a very simple question, but thank you, John, for that. The answer is it depends. <laughs> we have three minutes and then they kick us out. Do you have a talk tomorrow you want to promote? I do. So uh, if you are hanging around at OD Tug for another day, and I hope you are, um, I will be chatting about SQL plan management, being able to have plan stability in your production environments uh, uh, using SQL plan management tomorrow, which is a non-cost option to the Oracle database and will be is available in standard edition now, starting with 18C. 
So uh, no excuses for not showing up. Uh, that is a really good session that's on tomorrow. What about you, Jeff? Can Any I plug more? one too? Yeah. So Chris and I will be talking about uh, SQL Developer, all things SQL Developer, which is also free, and uh, how it's gone from being a desktop application to now how it's also available in your browser via ORDS, which is also free. And then we'll throw in some of our personal favorite uh, tips and tricks between the two platforms. Awesome. And now I would like you to also stay in this room to see our distinguished master, awesome product manager, Bryn Llewellyn, who will be talking about Security for the database, important stuff, stay. He, he's a very entertaining speaker. Thanks everyone. Thank you guys.